Today is a little different vlog. It's not going to be generally baseball related. It's going to be a little bit history related. We are walking to Union Station, Kansas City. Not a very far walk. It's basically across the street from where we live. We're walking through Crown Center to get there. We're now we're inside the Western Town Center Hotel, which is built into a side of a lot pool. All right, last week we had a game between the Newark Eagles and the St. Louis Cardinals in that series. Murray Dixon was pitching for the Cardinals, and I read a little something about Murray Dixon that really picked my interest. He pitched in a game as a teenager for an American Legion team in this area of Leavenworth, Kansas. That had an effect on American crime history in the 1930s. Had there not been a game that he pitched in there, a particular crime would not have happened, and that's what today's blog is going to be about. It's a history blog. So where we're going is Union Station, Kansas City. And across the street from Union Station, Kansas City is the World War I Memorial. And, um, this block is going to be centered around an event that took place here, June 17, 1933. <laughs> This was the arrangement of the parking lot on June 16, 1933, June 17. This will be a row of taxis right here. There's an event that took place right here is what we're going to talk about. This is West Penway Street. And it swings around the corner, and it, there's another street called Broadway that goes south. Brian, you can't do a vlog on it, just telling <laughs> So, Fred Harvey's is here. Fred Harvey's used to be, this is Fred Harvey's now, used to be the ticket agent place where they sold tickets to the trains, and the restaurant Fred Harvey's was here. back in the 30s and 40s and 50s. When I knew it as a child, it was what it looked like in the 50s. <laughs> I don't know, a single tag, that's something new. Okay, rather than do this live in front of Union Station because there's a lot of traffic going on there and a homeless man on the bench in front of there, I don't want to disturb things. So we'll do it with green screen. This green screen is a postcard for Union Station, not from the 30s, probably the 40s and 50s or 50s. But the city behind Union Station probably looked pretty much as it does in this picture in 1933. Murray Dixon, a pitcher for the St. Louis Cardinals and other teams, was a uh, five foot ten, uh, about 165 pounds, not very big guy, but he knew how to get people out. And his manager Eddie Dyer uh, called him Little Edison too, uh, because of his guile and the variety of ways he could get batters out. Before he was a pitcher with the Cardinals, though, um, 
Murray Dixon was raised in Tracy, Missouri, which is a suburb of Kansas City nowadays. It was kind of a little too far away to be called a suburb in 1933. Only about 100 people live there, a very small community, halfway between here and Weston, Missouri, or directly north of Leavenworth, Kansas, where Leavenworth Penitentiary and Fort Leavenworth are located. Uh, Murray was moved to Leavenworth when he was nine years old. The family moved there and he played baseball. By the time he was 19, he was on the American Legion team in Leavenworth, Kansas. And his team was picked to play a game inside the Kansas State Penitentiary, about six miles south of Leavenworth in Lansing, Kansas. They played another Legion team from Topeka and it was Decoration Day Memorial Day, uh, May 31st, 19, May 30th, rather, 1933. It was a big day for the prison. All the prisoners were allowed to go to the baseball game and watch baseball, not the ones in solitary confinement. And there were a few, though, there that had other festivities in mind. And those few were Harvey Bailey, a bank robber, um, Bob Brody, another member of his gang, and William Underhill Jr., who was basically a cold-blooded killer, also of this same gang, and they were known as the Cookson Hills Gang. They operated out of northwestern Oklahoma during the Depression years, and before, they actually operated in the 1920s as well. Uh, a little four, there's a four corners there. There's Kansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and uh, Missouri. They did crimes in all four of those states. Harvey Bailey was known as the Tri-State Terror. I kind of wondered why he was known as Tri-State Terror, because he also did things in Arkansas. But the people were referring to Oklahoma, Missouri, and Texas. A couple of them lived in Joplin, Missouri. Now, fast forward, or before the Decoration Day of 1931, they were all arrested on a Kansas City golf course. They were at the Kansas City Golf Club on the fourth hole, and an agent named Raymond Caffrey, an FBI agent, arrested them with the help of Kansas City Police. Uh, Harvey Bailey at the time had $500 in his pocket. He was natally attired in golf course. He had, a, had on high socks and knickers. But the $500 had the serial numbers of the Fort Scott bank robbery that he participated in. And on those charges, he was sent to Lansing State Prison in Kansas. Same as the other two. Now, uh, during the game, they hatched a plan with the help of another of their gang members by the name of Frank Nash. Frank Nash was on one hole behind the four when they were arrested, and he escaped the notice of the police, and he was not arrested. And uh, sometime during the year before Decoration Day, he slipped six Navy Colts into the prison for Harvey Bailey's use and William Underhill Jr.'s used primarily those two uh, plan the escape. And they hatched a plot to kidnap the warden during the baseball game that Murray Dixon was pitching. And that's what caught my attention last week when Murray Dixon was playing on my channel. Uh, before I played that game, I read about him, and that's why I heard he pitched actually pitched that game. He was losing in that game. So was the warden. The warden actually showed up an hour late, so that kind of threw off the plans. Uh, part of the plan was there was a maintenance truck parked next to the wall, and it had a ladder for the maintenance crew. Uh, turns out the ladder was not in the truck, but that, that's later. Uh, eventually, the warden does show up at the game, uh, and Harvey Bailey and William Underhill Jr. and Brady emerge from under the bleachers with their guns and a metal cable. They put the wire around the warden's neck from behind and told him if he did anything that they didn't tell them to do, that he would be, throat would be slit by that metal wire. And they put a gun on his back and marched him down the first base line to the chairs of the inmates. And some of the inmates said, can we go too? And there were in fact, six tagalongs, not part of the original plan. Uh, the ladder was not in the truck, so they had to commandeer a rope. They threw a rope over the wall and everybody, including the warden, his name was Kirk Prather, and he was rather obese, climbed up that rope and down the wall. Harvey Bailey was last to go, and someone, one of the guards, took a shot at Harvey Bailey and hit him behind the right knee as he was 
repelling down the outside of the wall. Waiting outside the wall was a large coupe or a large uh, sedan. And uh, they all piled into that car and drove off with the warden. They went just a uh, short ways and then they commandeered another car driven by three women and took those women hostage along with the warden. So, and told the six tag alongs plus a man, a man named Sawyer, I think helped plan this escape. Uh, they told them all to get lost and they escaped actually, except for Sawyer. Uh, he was found the next day in Arkansas and rearrested and sent back to Leavenworth. Um, the three women they kidnapped. Uh, so actually there were four gangsters in the car escapees, the warden plus three women. Uh, that's like four, five, what, eight, nine people. But they were all piled into this car and they did get away. Where they went to was probably Vern Miller's house at 6612 Edgevale Road in Brookside, Missouri, a suburb of Kansas City. And uh, often, and they took Bailey. He they hid him out in the attic for two weeks while his wound healed. I don't think his leg was broken. The guard thought his leg was probably broken, but um, we'll see later that he could function. <laughs> two weeks later, we're going to skip forward now and move to toward Union Station, Kansas City. Now, remember, Frank Nash is the man who was part of the gang who slipped in guns. Well, he was arrested in Joplin, Missouri, shortly after that prison escape, about two weeks after that. Uh, he was cheating on his wife. Wife didn't like it, so she dropped a dime on him, called the sheriff of um, I think Oklahoma City, Arkansas. His name was Otto Reed, and he had a, another man named um, Joe Lackey that he brought with him. And uh, Otto Reed and Joe Lackey went to Joplin and arrested Frank Nash and with the intent to bring him back to Ludmore Penitentiary. They're waiting for the train in Joplin. The train was supposed to leave Joplin at midnight. And while they were in the waiting room, there happened to be a UPI reporter, newspaper reporter. And the UPI newspaper reporter overheard them talking, talking about transferring the prisoner, Frank Nash. Uh, that was news. That was worthy of the newspaper. So the reporter reported it to his newspaper and apparently mob connections at the newspaper immediately got word to mob boss in Kansas City, Johnny Lazia, that a gangster, Frank Nash, was being transported there and would show up at 710 the next morning. Everything had to go through Johnny Lazio in Kansas City. Now, he is sometimes referred to, I think his grave says Lazio, but uh, he was, I think, commonly known as Johnny Lazia grew up in the Columbus Park region of Kansas City, Missouri, was a very dangerous area. It was controlled by a uh, mob called the Black Hand. And um, there were many, many murders in that about 10 square block area, uh, just east of what is now the River Market in Kansas City. But that's where Lazio uh, took control of that criminal activity there. And he ended up being the mob boss of Kansas City. So nothing happened in gangland without his permission. Uh, he had to give a thumbs up or a thumbs down for anything that happened gang-wise, illegal-wise. He was very popular in Kansas City because he was a very generous man. He ran the Democratic election machine for Tom Pendergast, the boss of Kansas City. Many think he was the mayor of Kansas City, but he was not. There was another man who was a mayor who had no power. He was out of the city council. Uh, Pendergast was a... A rich man who owned a concrete co um, company in Kansas City, which built the, you see these cement buildings behind me, behind Union Station. Uh, his company provided the cement for that. You know, the City Hall, the Federal Building, um, all the biggest buildings. The City Hall, when it was built during the Depression, was the second tallest city hall in the nation. Uh, that was all Pendergast concrete. Harry Truman, the president who became president of the United States, came up through Pendergast machine, um, was a good friend of Pendergast. He um, didn't always agree with Pendergast. I learned today that when he was um, working in Kansas 
a politician in Kansas City. He was laying out the road system and he did not use Pendergast concrete. That was a problem with Pendergast. And Harry Truman said, I'm not going to use it because your concrete's too expensive. So even among friends, there can be dis disagreements. So anyway, um, Lazio contacted a gangster named Vern Miller in Kansas City. He was a former sheriff in South Dakota who stole money from the county and was arrested and he escaped prison and later became connected with Frank Burke's gang in Chicago. Frank Burke is the man who engineered the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, one of the machine gunners there in Chicago in 1929, February. Vern Miller was basically an assassin. Lazio called Miller. Actually, the phone call uh, actually happened from Union Station in the middle of the night. That's provable by the records. And uh, there's no doubt that Vern Miller was part of this escapade. The plan was to intercept the lawmen. Um, now, first of all, let's look at the lawmen's plan. The lawmen had three lawmen coming up on the train from Joplin, Missouri, with the prisoner Frank Nash. There was actually a uh, jail cells in Union Station at the time. But the plan was not the, which they had to use to hold prisoners that were being transported on the train. But the plan was not to use those jail cells. The lawmen from Kansas City were contacted and two police officers, plus a, an FBI agent, Raymond Caffrey, who actually was the man who originally arrested the, the gang that escaped from Lansing, uh, were to provide two cars and they would drive the prisoner in those two cars from Union Station to the penitentiary in Leavenworth, Kansas, about a 40 minute drive. So um, they were armed. They had um, actually read betterly. The FBI did not have a gun. The two sheriffs from Oklahoma had two shotguns and they had three pistols among them. And the policemen waiting at Kansas City with the two cars, they were armed with pistols. Their opposition, the gangsters led by Vern Miller, had Tommy guns. And uh, not just any Tommy guns, they had guns that were stolen by Johnny Lazio's crew uh, mobsters uh, when they robbed an armory, a military ar armory in Kansas City. Uh, these were the same machine guns used in the Union Station Massacre. Later, Johnny Lazio, a year later, was assassinated by one of those guns. Uh, that's provable by the ballistics that KCPD PD did. Lazio was the crime boss, who, but he had rivals, and one of the rivals did him in in front of his residence at the Park Central Hotel, where I had my first job, and he lived in the penthouse. Uh, of course, this was 30 years before I worked there, but I cleaned his penthouse many, many times. Uh, I was 15 years old and working as a maid at the Park Central Hotel, my first job. So uh, that's where those where the mobs gang uh, guns came from. Now there's three theories as to who the gangsters were that were to intercept Frank Nash and set him free. Uh, there was no question about Frank Miller, but the official FBI ruling was that it was Adam Machete and Pretty Boy Floyd. Uh, I don't agree with that interpretation. There is a book put out by a man named Bob Unger. His name is Bob Unger, and the name of his book is The Kansas City Massacre, The Original Sin of the FBI. I agree with Bob Unger, and, and even Bob um, Unger does not definitively say exactly who it was, but he believes it was the escapees from the Lovemore Penitentiary. Uh, there's two other theories. The other two theories are um, Vern Miller and two or three other local gangsters. One was named Solly Weissman. Um, some people think they were involved because of the fact that these guns came out of Lazio's stockpile that he stole, has been stolen from the armory. There's another theory that, um, that the FBI went with, and that's Adam Machete and Pretty boy Floyd, but Bob Unger believes that it's escapees from Lansing Penitentiary, Vern Miller, Harvey Bailey, William Underhill Jr., and Bob Brady. There were lots of eyewitnesses to this 
famous crime. It was one of the most famous crimes of the 1930s. Um, there was a line of taxis in front of Union Station. Uh, one of the Red Caps was a very good eyewitness to this crime. He was just feet away from the shootings. There were six nuns who were on the sidewalk near the east door. When the shooting started, four of them ducked into the Union Station. Two of them were petrified and just stood there. And there were various other people from the parking lot. The lead investigator for the FBI was a man named Gus Jones. And he was an old fashioned lawman. He was a former Texas Ranger, always wore cowboy hats and believed in the old fashioned ways of doing police work. Uh, he immediately interviewed all the witnesses and many of the witnesses pointed the finger at Harvey Bailey and William Underhill and Vern Miller. In those days in the 1930s, gangsters were semi-famous. I mean, uh, they were somewhat celebrities. Their wanted posters were posted all over post offices and people generally looked, looked knew what they looked like. Not like the days of the Old West when Jesse James could leave, live at 10th and Woodland Avenue in Kansas City, Missouri for more than a year during his bank robbery days and mix with the high society of Kansas City and clubs and whatnot and never be recognized. People just generally didn't know what Jesse James looked like. Uh, another word about, since I mentioned Jesse James, another word, you can draw a straight line from these outlaws to Jesse James, and it works like this. Uh, Harvey Bailey and uh, Underhill and Brody were not your common depressionary bank robbers, and they were also train robbers. They actually operated before the 30s, before the stock market crash. They operated in the 1920s. They came out of a Cooks and Hills gang in Northeast Oklahoma, I said that. And they were trained by a man named Alan Spence. And Alan Spence was trained in his gangster ways by a man named Henry Starr, spelled S-T-A-R-R. -R. Henry Starr was the nephew of the husband of the Old West outlaw, Bell Starr, who lived in Oklahoma. Bell Starr was married to Sam Starr, I think a full-blooded Cherokee Indian, and Henry Starr was Sam Starr's nephew. Bell Starr and Henry Starr were cattle rustlers. They were well connected to the outlaw factions in Oklahoma, and uh, that's where they go back to. Bell Starr grew up in Carthage, Missouri. Her name was uh, Mabel Shirley before she married Sam Starr. And uh, her brother, Bud Shirley, was a bushwhacker during the Civil War with other bushwhackers, such as the Youngers and Jesse James, and they actually knew each other. Bud Shirley was killed during the Civil War by Union troops. He was surrounded at a farmhouse, and he didn't get out alive. They killed him. Uh, Belle Starr and her family moved from Missouri during those turbulent times, and they went down to Syene, Texas, which was near Dallas, Texas. And it was a small community that had six saloons and about 100 people lived there, maybe 200. And it was a well-known place for bushwhackers to go to during the Civil War when they could not operate in Missouri in the wintertime because it was just too cold. And um, it was kind of like their vacation time. <laughs> uh, so Cole Younger and Jesse James and other bushwhackers. And you see that in the movie Writing with the Devil um, they go down to Texas, and that's exactly what happened. They, uh, the start, the Shirley's, uh, Bell's father, uh, hosted those bushwhackers uh, when they were in Texas in the winter time, and then they would go back in the spring and summer and prosecute their end of the war during those days. So you can draw a straight line from these outlaws even all the way back to people like Jesse James and Bell Star. Their plan was not to shoot and kill anybody. Um, they had machine guns. They wanted to set Frank Nash free and return a favor for Frank Nash, getting them out of prison in Lansing. They approached the car. As they were loading the prisoner into the car, they put him in the front seat, the prisoner, in the front seat behind the steering wheel. Uh, that was Frank Nash. They had to do that because the only way to access the back seat in the car was through the the the, the uh, front seat on the passenger side. You had to fold down, and then you crawled in behind that to get into the back seat. 
one of the deputies carrying the shotgun from Oklahoma sat directly behind Frank Nash. There was a bit major problem here, though, because the deputy had the wrong shotgun. He was carrying the sheriff's shotgun, and he was totally unfamiliar with that weapon. The sheriff was carrying the deputy shotgun, and the mix-up happened when they left the train uh, to go up to the lobby of Union Station. They just grabbed the wrong shotguns. The shotgun the deputy had was a lethal, all shotguns are lethal, but this was an especially lethal weapon. It was a shotgun that carries six shells, and if you held the trigger down with the safety off, which you had to flip up about an eighth of an inch to set the safety up, but if you held the trigger down with the safety up, it fired automatically in succession. So in a matter of seconds, six shells, shotgun shells with 12 pellets apiece, that's like 72 bullets, would be fired in a matter of a couple of seconds. Very lethal weapon, and it's a weapon that was used in trench warfare fair by the Americans in World War II. Um, they used um, that very effectively and so effectively against the Germans that the Germans complained to the um, international arbiters governing warfare, and uh, they didn't like that weapon. And so it was a very deadly weapon, and the deputy was unfamiliar with it. So the gangsters approached the car from four, from three sides. There were four gangsters. Their car was was parked near the street, West Penway, in front of the station. It was a green Plymouth, and it was pointed west. The patrolman's cars that they wanted to transport the prisoners in were facing north and south, and they were in the first row in the parking lot uh, toward Union Station. They said, the gangster said, up, 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 one of them said, and that startled the deputy behind the prisoner and the gun he, that caused him to discharge the shotgun, which killed Frank Nash right off the bat. And that's what precipitated the shooting. When that happened, the shooting continued. Now there are, there is evidence and obvious photographic evidence to this day. When you look at the car, the shotgun blast that killed Frank Nash blew the windshield outward rather than the shell coming from in from outside of the car into the car. Uh, there was another blowout in a glass near the um, driver's side, and that might have been a second blast from the deputy shotgun that hit another policeman. But no one has ever proved that. Uh, of course, KCPD picked up shells and did, did ballistics, but uh, the book, um, KCPD was not exactly forthright in coming out with the ballistics the way it was. The FBI at the time didn't have a ballistics operation quite as sophisticated as Casey's, and they used the KCPD uh, ballistics lab to go. That's where they discovered that the guns were guns that were stolen from the military by the Lazio gang. But anyway, there was a blast from a second blast from inside the car that may have hit another police officer. The firing immediately took the lives in within seconds of four of the police officers. Another one, Frank Smith, was inside the car already. He went down to the uh, floorboard face first and played dead, and he he was not shot. Um, one officer was severely wounded. He survived, and uh, Reed Betterly. Uh, was slightly wounded. He ran toward the uh, east door of Union Station, and one of the gunmen turned toward him to try to kill him. He missed. He didn't miss Union Station. He hit the broadside of Union Station, and there are bullet holes that you could find there to this day. That's a little disputed since the 1990s, because when Union Station was renovated, they repaired some of those bullet holes, but you can see um, variations in the stonework where the bullet holes were repaired and then there are three holes that are bullet holes that were not repaired uh, and were left there uh, so um, that's interesting evidence from the Kansas City Massacre that you can see to this this day uh, the gunmen afterwards were uh, there was a witness that was very important to the FBI. Her name was Lottie West. She was a travel uh, traveler's aid agency agent. She had a desk near the east door, and she used the name Pretty Boy Floyd. She was the only witness to use that name, and that's what the FBI 
ran with. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But Lottie West ran outside. Another policeman was near the east door from inside the Union Station. When the shooting started, he ran out the east door as the lawman was running in and toward away from the gunman. Uh, his name was Myron Fanning, and he's very uh, um, important in this little story, too, because he has a connection to one of my relatives who was working at Union Station at the time, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, Lottie West pointed at the gunman and said to My Myron Fanning, get him. And he fired off three shots of his revolver toward one of the gangsters. One of the gangsters fell down and may or may not have been shot by Myron Fanning. Um, that has never really been determined. Uh, he got back up again and got into the fleeing car. The gangsters drove down West Penway toward Broadway and turned south on Broadway toward Penn Valley Park and escaped. Now there's a lot of extenuating circumstances. Um, to make a long story short, Rochetti, who was blamed by the FBI and Pretty Boy Floyd, uh, had kidnapped a sheriff in Bolivar, Missouri, the night before the Union Station Massacre on September 16th. And they had an idea to drive to Kansas City to frolic in the West Bottoms with some women there. And they needed a car and they went to a garage to steal a car. And just as they arrived at the garage, the sheriff had walked in. So they kidnapped him and took his car. And uh, they drove across Missouri and showed up in Lee Summit, Missouri, where they let the sheriff go. And then they went on to, to the West Bottoms in Kansas City. The uh, people who I really believe did it, and Bob Unger believes did it, were blamed for a bank robbery in um, Arawak, Oklahoma, about 350 miles from Kansas City. And um, I, I, they may or may not have been there and dro drove all night. Either way, Pretty Boy Floyd and um, Rochetti had a long drive to get to Kansas City that morning and get there by 7 p.m., 7, 7 a.m. Or Bailey and Underhill Jr. and Brody driving out from the bank robbery, which they did at 8.45 a.m. on 6, June 16th from Oklahoma to arrive in Kansas City. Uh, one of the two of those are true. I believe the bank robbers did the Kansas City massacre. So anyway, um, they escaped. Um, Vern Miller went straight to Chicago after the Union Station massacre before the government caught up with him. Uh, old enemies from Detroit's Purple Gang caught up with him and about six months after the massacre they assassinated Vern Miller in Chicago. Miller wanted to get help from Frank Burke's gang to hide out and uh, he did he did hide out from the government. They didn't catch him. The Purple Gang caught him and killed him. Uh, the others um, Bailey and Underhill uh, were later arrested for bank robbery and sent back to prison. Um, Bailey signed a confession to the Oklahoma. When he was um, arrested, he had money in his pocket, just like he, <laughs> like he did in the golf course when he was arrested from that robbery. Uh, he said that he originally he said that he got that money from a friend and that he didn't do the robbery. But later, after he was arrested, people started wondering, did he do the Union Station Massacre? So suddenly he did the robbery <laughs> and he signed the document uh, flatly stating that he was in Oklahoma robbing a bank and not in Kansas City killing FBI agents and Kansas City policemen. So uh, the point of the blog is if there was no baseball game in Decoration Day, 1931, Kansas State present, pitched by Murray Dixon. There probably would not have been any Kansas City ma Massacre. And the upshot of the Kansas City Massacre was a very, very famous and important crime in U.S. history. Before the FBI agent killed, and he was only the second FBI, that's Raymond Caffrey, he was the only the second FBI agent killed in the line of duty working for the FBI. Uh, but before that, they had very little authority, and they were not allowed to carry firearms. Some did carry firearms for personal protection, but Herbert Hoover used that crime uh, before the Congress of the United States to get laws passed to allow the FBI to carry weapons 
and to have more arresting power. And uh, that can that's the turning point for that happening, the Kansas City Massacre. If you, re if you remember the uh, policeman, Myron Fanning, who came out of the station and was pointed to the gunman by Lottie West and fired three shots at the fleeing gunman, that was Myron Fanning. And I said he was a connect. There is a connection there to my uncle. His name was Roy Neely. My last name's Neely. And my uncle Roy was a red cap at the time. Later, he was assistant um, station master at Union Station. But Roy, um, his connection with Myron Fanning came as follows. This is sort of an epilogue and a trivia question. Most people believe four four police officers were killed at the Union Station massacre. Um, there are actually seven officers involved. I think I had that wrong earlier. Uh, three of them escaped. Uh, Joe Lackey was the deputy who fired the first shot that killed Nash. He was shot in the back three times but by the gangsters, but he survived. Betterly was wounded in the arm and got into the to Union Station and escaped. He survived. And Frank Smith wasn't shot. He survived. The, the officers died were FBI agent Raymond Caffrey. Uh, Otto Reed, the sheriff from Oklahoma City, um, two Kansas City policemen named Grooms and Hermanson. I read a book by a grandson by Hermanson, uh, I think grandson or son, and um, that was many, many years ago. I don't remember a lot from that book, but I read that book. So um, Myron Fanning, two weeks after the massacre, was pointed to by a Kansas City journalist in the Kansas City Star who suggested that when he fired the three shots, he killed one of the officers. Friendly fire. I don't believe that's true, and nobody believed that was true. Uh, my Uncle Roy knew Fanning. He knew Lottie West. I mean, he knew the people that were involved. He knew the witness, some of the witnesses who saw the crime. Uh, nobody believed that the police officer shot one of the lawmen who were killed. They were all killed by the gangsters. But this played on the mind of Myron Fanning, and eventually he lost his mind. Um, almost a year later, he was at Union Station. He was the normal policeman who was uh, normally there to guard the station. Everybody knew him. But for a period of about two weeks, he started acting strangely, and that was noticed by Lottie West and others. And uh, after that period of two weeks where he started acting strange, he believed that he was a Confederate officer who needed to go get food for his hungry troops. And what he had in mind was going down to the Fred Harvey restaurant storage room where there were apples that night and um, use those to feed his troops. So there was a commotion. There were a couple of workers, workers down there at the time. It was 10 p.m. at night. The station wasn't very busy. The station in the 50s when I was little was very, very busy. 253 trains a day in and out every six minutes. But it was kind of quiet. Uh, but there was a commotion. And my Uncle Roy was down there by that room, which, which was down by the train tracks with the trains. And the station master was down there. Or I think my uh, uncle may have fetched the station master. And another policeman named Schroeder was down there. And when they approached Officer Fanning, in the storeroom who wanted the apples. They asked him what's going on and he looked at them with a strange look on his face that they did not understand or know of and said that if any of you move, I'll kill you. Pointed a gun at them. Um, my uncle and the station master were able to duck out of the doorway and they ran to a telephone near the tracks. Phone failed, didn't work. So then they had to run upstairs to get into the station to another phone. When they got near the top of the stairs, they heard gunshots. And uh, they continued on to the f phone and called the Kansas City Police to come quick. And they went down by the tracks and found Officer Schroeder dead laying across a baggage cart on the train station platform. He had been shot by Officer Myron Fanning. Fanning was nowhere to be found. Fanning did turn himself in two weeks later and um, he went to trial about a year later. My uncle testified. You can read all about it in newspapers.com and the Kansas City Star. Uh, uncle testified. The station master testified. 
Others testified, and it was determined that Myron Fan uh, committed an act out of his mind. Insanity was ruled, and he was given a five-year prison sentence. He went away for five years. Now, my father also worked at Union Station. He, be, he came there two years after the massacre. In 1935, he started as a red cap during the Depression, and within two years, he was working as a ticket agent selling uh, tickets to the passengers on the trains, and he did that for 40 years and worked there until 1975. So in actuality, there were not four policemen killed at the Kansas City Massacre. There were actually really five, one, one year later. Anyway, a different blog. I am wearing a St. Louis Cardinals jersey in honor of Murray Dixon, uh, who pitched that game for the Lansing Prison Escape. Tomorrow we'll be back to uh, baseball, tabletop baseball. And we'll continue the series between the 1945 Detroit Tigers and the 1945 Cleveland Buckeyes. Hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for listening. Have a good day and God bless.